remember who you are. You're the only you. You were born to do great things in the world. All of those, she just gave us like five affirmations right there. <laughs> I'm here for every single one. Welcome to Can't Wait to Hear From You, brought to you by Hanakuma. I'm your host and ambassador of internal brain relations, Lovey Jai Jones. Please prepare as we enter the mind of Naomi Osaka in three, two, one. Hey everybody, welcome to Can't Wait to Hear From You. I'm your host, Lovey Jai Jones, New York Times bestselling author, speaker, and professor of troublemaking. In this show, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna be digging into the inner voice and the minds of some incredible people. And first up is iconic, one of one, one of the most gifted athletes in the world, Naomi Osaka. Welcome and thank you for letting me tour your brain. Thank you, thanks for visiting my mind. Yes, we're gonna take a tour of what's happening up there. So I'm excited to get into it. If you had to de like describe your inner voice and your relationship with your inner voice, how would you describe it? What is your inner voice saying to you? I kind of feel like I have two inner voices. Mm. Um, and usually I try to listen to the one that's very nice. Okay. So I would describe her as a she and she's very like soft spoken um, and positive. But then sometimes when I'm on the tennis court, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a different voice that's a little bit more stern. I, I hear from the gentle one now more. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure it's because my mindset for a lot of things changed and mm. maybe like in turn my inner voice is also kind of shifted, but... I would definitely say I hear the gentle one a lot more now. I would say um, the like the very quiet voice is that is I hope it's Bob Marley. You know the like the every little thing's gonna be all right song, and then the other one is kind of like it's a little bit more stern um, mm -hmm. and a little bit harsher. But I haven't heard the harsh voice in a while. As you've been in the public eye for a bit. Um, it can be unrelenting, as we all know, especially if you are on any margins. How has that shifted, even like how you talk to yourself when you hear everybody's opinions and it's coming at you? How, how does that have you walk through the world? I think I've gotten much better at it. Okay. I just realized like the only thing that I can do is be myself. And I don't want to say unapolog unapologetically, yeah. but like... I'm still figuring myself out and there's going to be times that I mess up, but it's just about how you pick yourself up and you learn from the situations. And I don't think I should bear the responsibility of like what people think of me because I'm already like, I guess, burdening myself with my own thoughts. So mm. just giving myself a lot of grace. And I love that. I think we all require that. So your profession is very much aligned with how people see you and how people think about you. In what ways is Naomi, who's on the court, different from Naomi, who's walking through life? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the me that's on the court is very confident. Mm. Like, because I've been playing tennis since I was three, and it's yeah. kind of the only thing that I was sure I was good at, if that makes sense. Yeah, and for sure. For me, outside of the court, I feel like I'm a student in life, mm. like I'm constantly just learning, so I don't really exude confidence as much. I'm kind of just observing. So for you on the court, are you driven by passion or competition? It's kind of hard. I would say I really love competition. Mm. I think that's like the whole point of wanting to play tennis is playing against the best players in the world. Yeah. But then passion is like, you're very passionate about the sport and like what you want to achieve. So I don't know, I, I kind of think I'm a little bit of both. So like you have a lot of firsts. First Asian player to hold top ranking in singles. First woman to win successive major single titles since Serena Williams. First Japanese player to contest a major singles final. First Japanese Grand Slam single champion. It's a lot of firsts, but I imagine like all these firsts comes with all this responsibility. So with the burden, how are you shedding and letting like Naomi, the person, be able to live? Because that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Um, honestly, I think this year, like this break that I'm taking yeah. has been really important for me because it sort of made me remember who I am. There's a lot of things that happened over the past like three years um, since like the French Open 
it just kind of made me a little angry inside. And I felt like I was changing a lot, mm -hmm. like my, the energy that I exude. Yeah. So it's been nice to kind of just center myself and remember all the things that are important to me. Is there more that you want to achieve in tennis? Me, yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot. Okay. So when you get back to the court, what is going to change about your approach? Or if there is going to be a change in your approach on that court, what will it be now that you're going to be a mom? I think for me, I'm going to have a totally different mindset. Really? Um, you know, appreciating it a lot more. Um, and then also just knowing, like, your time isn't forever. Mm, and okay. I have to kind of treasure the time that I have now. And it's just, like, a lot more appreciation. So let's talk about Hanakuma. You know, when did you get the idea? Where did it come from? Why did you move forward on it? For me, I've always, like, loved watching shows and documentaries and movies and yeah. reading books. And I was talking to my agent one day, and we were kind of discussing how there's a lot of, like, production companies, but you don't really see, like, female athletes have one. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say that's where it blossomed. Yeah. And then I thought it would be very interesting to kind of, like, share stories that I like or just approach scenarios or, like, show what I like to see. And that's, I, I would say that's how I was born, but I was very lucky to meet a lot of really cool people that are great at their job. What is the dream for Hanakoma? I'd say the dream is obviously to become a really amazing production company, which I feel like no bias, it already is. Come but. on, obviously. <laughs> um, I don't know, just to see how far it can go. I yeah. think I've been inspired by a lot of people. Of course, LeBron's doing amazing in all his businesses. It's definitely really interesting because as a kid, like when I think about being a tennis player and what those things can like bring me to, I wouldn't have thought of a production company, but watching other people and how they operate and seeing how that motivates me and inspires me to also do well. So your career has been led by a lot of mentors and you have a lot of maternal figures. What does women supporting women mean to you? And how is it going to show up in Hanakuma's work and storytelling? Um, yeah, for me, women supporting women are, is very important. Personally, I, I have a very strong relationship with strong women. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I don't know, I just feel proud whenever I see someone accomplish something. I think Hanakuma is doing a really good job, like mirroring what I want them to be able to tell and express. You know, I said before, but like obviously it can't happen without like a group of incredible people, and um, I'm I'm learning from them every single day. How many maternal figures are around you, and how are you like learning from them in this moment? I'm gonna say like five. Mm, okay. <laughs> um, and I don't know. I just learn from them. Just by seeing their actions, seeing how they, I guess, kind of navigate through life. Mm, okay. So as I know a lot of things have been happening that are new for you, like motherhood and things like that. What is something that you have noticed has shifted in the last year about the way you're seeing the world? I think just even my relationship with my mom mm. has changed a lot. Okay. Um, she is someone that's very bold. If you meet her, you're like, you'll remember her for sure. Okay. Um, and I just appreciate her so much more now because I know all of the things that she had to um, go through to raise me and my sister. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of anticipating, I guess, what my kid will feel for me and like all the hard times that we'll probably have to go through. But I realized that when I was younger, it didn't feel like tough times because my mom didn't allow it to feel like a tough time. I imagine that the moment you found out you were pregnant, a million thoughts were going on in your head. What was the first most authentic thought you had? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I was very worried, hmm. but I was just worried because I don't know if I'm gonna be a good mom. Mm. And so that was like my biggest concern, but I realized like everyone probably goes through that same feeling and that same experience. So you went from worry, and then what, at what point did you go, I, I can do this, I got this? Are you even there yet? <laughs> um, you know, like, I'm very lucky. I have a lot of really good people around me. Yeah. Um, and most of them are parents. I, okay. I didn't know I knew that many moms until, like, I started talking to them about it. But um, 
I think I have to kind of have that feeling of I have this. Yeah. Because I can't go into the situation like unconfident. Mm. So. That's important. So what scares you most about motherhood and then what excites you most? Oh, <laughs> I think what scares me is like discipline um, <laughs> because I have a dog and he doesn't really listen to me. And I know it's not good to say that because you're kind of defining him, but he's just really bad. But it's okay because he's cute and squishy. Do you think Butter is going to be a great big brother to the baby? Honestly, I'm not so sure because at the very beginning, he was like really cozying up to me. Okay. But now he's, I don't know if he's just being more independent, but he'll go like lay down somewhere else. Um, so I don't know if that just means he's growing up or he's like kind of upset about it. <laughs> so I guess I'll, I'll have to see what happens. You have to see. <laughs> so sometimes I'm wondering like, dang, if I'm not good at disciplining my dog, does that mean it'll like work the same way on a baby? I don't know. I don't want them to have like free range and be spoiled and stuff, but... I just feel like babies are so cute. Like, <laughs> I don't know. How would I be able to do that? And like, she calls me mom. And like, what am I supposed to do, you know? But I'm hoping because the baby will understand me, it won't be that bad. Well, from what I've heard, those little troublemakers do whatever they want. <laughs> and you just have to deal. One of my friends has a puppy and a baby. And she says they're the same person. Mm. They Neither one of them listens that well, but they just try to figure out what's best and hopefully they just start listening at some point they are their own people mm -hmm. that's that's the thing so what excites you most about it i don't know just growing together mm. um and i feel like i'm gonna learn a lot about myself as well like during the whole experience so i mean for me every morning is kind of interesting so i would say inner voice wise i was just really fascinated because i feel like my stomach grows a lot more every morning um, so I guess my inner voice was cheering me on in the sense of like being encouraged. It's also going to be really special to like know that this person relies on you for yeah. almost everything, if not everything. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Um, one person that's really close to me is also pregnant right now oh, with her second kid. Okay. So it's also just been really interesting to see like how she was handling her first child, which was a little scary because she always looked very tired all the time. <laughs> just to see the amount of love that she has for her kid and, you know, it, it's something that's really special. Listen, we have concealer for the moments when we have to look less tired than we actually are. Have you, are you the person who calls somebody and goes, is this weird that this is happening? Or are you just like, you know what? I'm just going to chill on it. I'm pretty much a chill person. Um, I could tell. I love that. No, I love that you're chill. It's going to come in very much handy. <laughs> it's going to come in handy because I'm telling you, them children are fascinating. What is your favorite thing about this moment when you're pregnant and you're basically baking this baby? <laughs> I would just say like feeling the movements. Mm. At first, like you're really creating a life inside of you. And yeah. sometimes I talk to them and say, hi, how are you doing? And then I feel like the hand or whatever. So what's your day's routine? An ideal day for Naomi, what does that look like? Uh, well, now it's like, I don't really leave the house, <laughs> um, but so. I'll like get up. I'll try to work out if I don't feel too nauseous. Okay. And then eat, we've, uh, my trainer's here, so we've been watching the playoffs. Okay. It's our, like, the highlight of our day. <laughs> um, but yeah, just, I guess, preparing. There's a lot of preparing. Mm, what's the best part of this preparing process? I don't know. It's kind of like a countdown now at this point. But okay. I guess the best part is just, like, spending time with people. Because yeah. um, normally I'm on the road a lot, so I don't really see a lot of my friends or my family. Mm. Have you started buying the cute little baby clothes? Yeah. Is your house being filled up with the tiny things? Um, it's not filled up, but like the garage is kind of full. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any rituals, any routines that you all had as a family that you uh, continue to pass on to your kid? Well, like my family always ate dinner together. Mm -hmm. So... I just remember, like, um, my mom coming home from work, and then we'd all have dinner. Well, she would have to cook, which now that I think about it is pretty exhausting, but 
for me as a kid, it was great. But yeah, just have dinner time together. And then on Sundays, we'd always do something because Sunday was like the best off there, so. Those are great rituals. And I think those things are what we hold on to. So to be a professional athlete, it's not just a physical endurance. It's like you need to be mentally prepared. You're an Olympian. You are just very much noted in this area. And I take it that it will take a lot of maintenance for you to maintain focus, for you to maintain wholeness. What are your favorite mental health tools to maintain wholeness? Um, I really love meditation. Mm. Um, kind of taking time to myself and like whether it's listening to music or just going on a walk mm. like in whatever city I'm in just to like feel the nature and feel the breeze. I think for me that's really effective. For somebody who has a hard time meditating, AKA me, what is a great tip you can give me on trying again? How do I quiet my thoughts? Honestly, for me, I, I don't think about quieting my thoughts. Mm. I kind of just let them run at its course. Okay. Because I felt like when I try to quiet them, they just get louder. Mm. So I just kind of let them go on until it just silences itself out. I'm going to have to try that again because I'm like, I'm the one who's trying to quiet my thoughts. And I'm like, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then music. What is your favorite genre of music? I don't really have a favorite genre. I like like old hip hop, old R&B. 90s? Yeah. Amen. We're aligned there. <laughs> yes. Um, but like genre wise, I'm not really that picky. Okay. Um, just something that, you know, is good. That is awesome. So you have music, walking, meditation. Out of all those three, if you could only pick one, what would it be that's like your cannot miss, must have? Oh, music. I think I'm a person that's mood is affected by music. Mm. And I also really love like good lyrics. So. Mm. I mean, we all discovered that when we got older that a lot of the, the music that we loved as kids, when we listened to the actual lyrics, you're like, that probably wasn't appropriate. <laughs> yeah. So I'm discovering more songs that I was like, oh, I should not have been listening to that at 10. But mm -hmm. hear you on that. No. Oh. Okay, so when you're going to bed at night, what is this inner voice saying as you're like laying down and let, letting the day pass? Honestly, um, I've just been thinking like I'm, I'm really grateful to be alive because mm. like it's not like every day is promised. Yeah. I've just, I don't know, I've just been really thankful. You've made some courageous decisions in the past to withdraw from competition when you did not feel like you were mentally prepared and your mental health was going to suffer for it. Were you supported? And like, what did your inner voice say when you were about to make this very public decision? Did you feel like it was a hard one? Was it, was it just like, I had to? I felt like it was a little bit of a hard one, but also... I also felt like I had to, um, mm. just because it wasn't like a one day decision. It mm, was like okay. something that I was living in for a little bit, um, like a couple days, just yeah. because um, at the start of the French Open, I said I would do no press and then it kind of became a big deal after that. So it was like a couple days and then I decided to withdraw. But for me, I always felt like I have to kind of stand on something once I feel that way. Like my dad's Haitian, so he we've kind of always had that like energy, if that made sense. Just yeah. to, like you kind of got to move the world forward a little bit. I also just felt really tired at the time. Yeah. And I've never felt like mentally drained like that before and I didn't think it was healthy. So No, it was such a great decision to make because it also modeled that you are bigger than the sport itself. For a lot of people, it taught them that they can actually choose themselves. Even when the whole world is watching you, it was super courageous, which is why I was like, I'm curious how hard it was. But no, thank you for that. So therapy is a tool that I deeply believe in. Have you been? And how has it been for you? I haven't physically been to therapy, but I've done it like on the phone and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say it's helped me a lot, just mm. being more confident in myself and... Um, I guess finding strategies yeah. to help me like not cope, but like be more comfortable with situations that I wasn't previously. 
when you are on any margins on these grand stages, these pedestals that people will place you on, I'm sure it it will it will hurt a, a few times when these arrows come to you. So yeah, I know you've talked openly about self doubt in the past. What would you tell a 20 year old who is dealing with self doubt, whether in college, whether just every day they're not sure whether they're worthy? What would you tell them? What advice would you give them? It's gonna be really hard right now, mm. and you're not ever really sure when it ends mm. but I feel like for me as long as I kept working hard there was going to be a lot of tough times but it'll eventually get you to the rainbow that you wanted or not even get you to the rainbow but you'll have an opportunity at the very least to go where you want or see what you want and I think knowing that if you put in hard work then you'll eventually get to where you want to go. And in the toughest moments of like public scrutiny, what is your go-to way to remind yourself of how amazing you are? I don't know. For me, I always just try to talk to my family. And then I always just remember like, it might be a little bad, but people's attention spans aren't that big. Facts. Like it, Facts. it feels suffocating in the moment, yeah. but like there's going to be something else that people talk about. And for me, I'm just going to keep living my life and um, what comes will come and what people will talk about, they'll talk about it, but I'll just, you just gotta keep moving on. And you've handled it incredibly well, <laughs> incredibly well. Are there things that you're like, I really wanna work on within myself as you're evolving? Like, what are you finding that are your checklists of like, here's what I wanna do for improvement? I want to, be less reactive. I think mm. that I'm naturally not a reactive person, but I was talking to my dad one day and he said like, usually the cause of anger is not understanding. Mm. So then I tried to think of all the times that I got angry and I was like, mm, maybe I didn't understand the situation and stuff like that. So just, I guess, going within myself a bit more during situations that feel a little bit complex to me. And how has that shifted when you're, you've actively been on the court and during this break, like your tools that you're using? Mm -hmm. I think it's shifted a lot. I can't really tell about on the court right now. Yeah. Um, but I think off the court, I've, you know, given myself a lot of grace. I've actually had better relationships with people, mm. um, even though, you know, I, it's not like I have like a huge social, social circle, yeah. but um, yeah, it's, it's been very interesting, like coming to understand people and just figuring things out. In a world that often isn't kind, especially to women, how do you show yourself kindness? How are you going to show yourself kindness this week? I guess just showing up for myself. Yes. Um, whether it's doing one thing a day that I find very relaxing or peaceful or just taking time to yourself and doing things that you enjoy. Mm, I'll take that. What are you going to do to be kind to yourself? Um, I'm going to go for a two-hour Thai massage sometimes this <laughs> week. Okay, that's how I'm going to be kind to myself and my body is I'm going to be stretched for two hours. <laughs> That sounds really nice. Oh, that's good. And do you have a mindset mantra? What is something that you, whether it's an affirmation, a lesson, a reminder, that you give yourself that you want to pass on to other people? I have two that okay. I think is in my head now. One of them is like, remember who you are. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is like, you're the only you in the world. Just be confident in yourself and know that People appreciate you and you were born to do great things in the world. All of those. She just gave us like five affirmations right there. <laughs> I'm here for every single one. Remember who you are. You were born to do great things. All of that. I think it's necessary. I put affirmations on my computer, mm -hmm. places where I can remember. So those are two that I'm going to keep with me. So thank you for coming to the show and sharing your mind with us. Anything else that you want to share with the peoples? I don't know. I just hope everyone treasures themselves mm. and know that they have a lot of self-worth and value. That's important. Y'all yeah. hear that? Y'all hear that? Thank you all for taking this ride with us on the first episode of Can't Wait to Hear From You, brought to you by Hanakuma. I'm your host, Lovey Jai Jones, and I was joined by Naomi Osaka for some amazing conversation around her inner voice, around self-doubt, around how she shows up in the world 
fully whole. So I hope you hit us with some comments and let us know what you think. As always, we can't wait to hear from you.